just going to be like we're all a little subdued this morning. Um, I, I think that's fine. It works for me. Um, I got late last night. Uh, I had to go cross town at Cindy Lauper. So uh, I'm in a really good mood. Uh, <laughs> I am a little sleepy, so this is fine. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have a, a solar event today. So I'm Amy Fuller, and I manage the Medical Home Portal. I also have 
out a little blurb from the academy that talks about yoga a little bit, and then an article that uh, Green Tree Yoga and Life Wonderful. Um, so we have Green Tree in our service directory on the home portal. Um, do you know what kind of locations they have? Is it just the one location kind of for the Yeah, right. So they are committed to helping you find your people uh, find services that are developmentally appropriate for um, uh, families. No, I, I think that's fantastic. So Dr. Luz Allen um, works with the Utah chapter of the AAP. Um, the webinar that he's mentioning, um, it has to do with um, primary care providers and teams identifying um, particularly behavioral health uh, resources in the community. And uh, so that'll be on November 3rd. And is that something that's going to be streamed live, or is it going to be available on the archive after the fact? I mean, generally people aren't coming to it because they go into it. By the way, the web, the old web, webinar, X, whatever that is, which never was really quite good enough. I think the place was something very, very technologically good. So, Excellent. so people that have had problems with the webinar uh, before WebEx uh, can look forward to it better. Very good. All right. Great. Yeah, here's Green Tree Yoga. Um, so Green Tree Yoga programs are for kids with special needs, educators, health care providers, and yoga teachers, art and yoga class special needs. There's an online calendar. They work with uh one schools as well. Um, trauma informed yoga at the VA for veterans, that's wonderful. Yeah, Green Tree seems like this is just perfect. Great. Anyone else? I have kind of an, uh, an interesting case. I got an email from a dad whose son is on SSI. He is nonverbal autism, um, but his wife apparently had maybe a TBI or something, um, so she can't work. She's applying for SSI in their going to the appeals process. Um, but they're having trouble making ends meet. Um, so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. If anybody knows of some resources, perhaps this family could tap into. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Is it the third appeal that you're going to be going through? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, they're waiting for the appeal. Um, um, she is on her third appeal. So um, Betton's going to be a no. Does she have a legal Does she have an
got some, some pretty uh, serious uh, family stuff going on right now. But uh, we'll, we'll put our heads together um, as well. And if folks think of anything um, you know, throughout the day and just want to send you a list or prepare myself about some ideas for this, um, we certainly will. So, so they are applying for SSI for the child. They have it for the child, yeah. Which pays, he works, the dad works, um, and the child SSI pays a lot of the bills. But he did mention that the child was nonverbal and basically has yes or no. Um, so he's pretty difficult to, you know, that'd be a difficult situation in its own, but then mom has an issue. Did, did, did dad indicate why mom had not been successful the last couple of times? Is it some sort of an income slash assets related type of thing, or is it? They're not determining her to be disabled. I think they're not determining her to be disabled. Um, like, so, and she has a traumatic brain injury, the history of the Yeah. So I call that a traumatic brain injury association. Okay. And we can talk with them. The, the director there has been really great, and maybe you can um, run some of the tasks down and they can direct them down with her. Okay.
know, somehow that can show an intellectual delay or if there's some kind of almost comorbid diagnosis. If there's more going on than the medical review board, we'll look at that whole picture and decide based on that. So this stuff, the autism itself may not qualify for this diagnosis, but you may want to investigate and maybe working on that, but just is there anything else going on that you can couple and put on top of the autism? Um, they, that's what they'll look at at that point. The other piece, too, they do look at, um, you, you have to provide a functional ability report as well as, as a parent, you know. So as you report daily living activities, they certainly look at that and say, how much does this hinder that child's yeah. ability to function? So being very honest and truthful in, in how your daily functioning that with those children is, is an important piece of that as well. So yeah, I found this. Now this is... Um, this is not specific to Utah, but it, it doesn't talk to it about any sort of diagnosis specifically. It just talks about kind of that bigger picture. Um, medical expenses that significantly reduce their usable income, and what some states require versus others to kind of prove that. But clearly that's 
something that's important to them and probably a primary focus. But yeah, it does. It certainly just says um, people with disabilities. So, so we'll we'll double check that carefully and add that to our our directory and make it clear um, and, and send that out in our notes what what they actually will support. Who they can that's, that's, I love hearing stories like that. It's great. Wonderful. All right, yeah, we'll make sure that that gets added and that people are aware of what they, they provide and what they can do. Thank you. Anybody else? I an entry for like a 72-year-old boy with ASD and borderline uh, intelligence is 70. Mother uh, fired the uh, venue that you know the agency that was involved with them. They spoke with quite good reason, but now she's got all of that on top of you know the family support component of the SPD. Uh -huh. So they've given her the responsibility to come up with the, the uh, service, and they're not helping her. So I I think she's very overwhelmed. For being a very good nurse and you know responsible person, but she was wondering about uh, getting in her and uh, I you know I've been to big brother, big sister, but that's probably not going to work for for him, and then, uh, maybe that. Uh, organization, uh, partnership, peer, peer to peer, that we give about, what, two months, with a peer. And then uh, that's 4-H uh, used to have us. And, and they still do it in rural counties, have a, a mentor program. And where is the young man? Yeah, I found them too. 
mean, it varies all over the state. But we like to make it available. And if you know of a family that is interested, we also will have families come. Um, and like Utah Parent Center, we'll have them come and train so they can take it back to their community. So that's always an option. You were saying families in more rural areas. All right, so that's about Nami Utah. Um, Utah Family Coalition works under a grant to provide the Family Resource Facilitator Project. That's also statewide. And we do have Family Resource Facilitators all over the state. Right now, we're up to 56 Family Resource Facilitators. Um, they work at no charge to the family. And they're available to any parent and caregiver who has a youth with a mental health, behavioral, substance use, Developmental disability. We work with all families who have used with complex needs. Um, what I heard the gentleman in the back talking about, a family resource facilitator could work with that family and help them find who among their natural supports might be a good mentor for this youth. They can help develop natural support networks for families. They can help explore some of the other programming and options and help this mom navigate through that. Um, this gentleman here who talked about the family with the SSI application process and um, financially. Um, our FRS are walking through work manuals. <laughs> and they know, they, they keep abreast of what's happening um, as far as what grants are coming up, what programs are operating, what they're very on top of community resources in their community. So they could, we could link a family, you could have a family, that family call a family resource facilitator and they could come in and work with them for a while and help them you know, stabilize that crisis. They're not crisis workers, but they can help with some immediate resource coordination. Um, the main role of family resource facilitators is our peer support to parents and caregivers because they have been there and done that. All of us, I was an FRS when the program first started um, nine years ago, and I was a family resource facilitator for three years. Um, and now I'm a mentor, so I coach, train, and mentor other family resource statewide, including the 10 that we have here in Salt Lake County, which is really good. So we have 10 here. We have two Spanish-speaking family resource facilitators, um, which has really been helpful. We have a lot of Spanish-speaking families in need. Um, they work, again, with the parents and caregivers and peers to help them link with the resources they need, advocate for their child at school, with the treatment provider, um, with support. We have, one, we, have, we have one at the court, we have two that their offices are at DCFS because families sometimes become involved with DCFS. Um, I always think it's ironic if you read about like the, some of the things to look for for autism, there are also some of the things to look for for child abuse. <laughs> so, you know, if you read through the list, they're kind of similar. Running away, unexplained, you know, there can be a lot of different things that are just, you know, they come with developmental disabilities. And so some of our parents are actually being, you know, reported sometimes. And, and so we work with those families and help to navigate that process and advocate for them and help them get the services that they need for their child. Um, so we work across all systems, um, meaning juvenile justice, the courts, schools, um, treatment, mental, mental health treatment, substance use treatment. Um, we, Next family to whatever resources they need um, in, the, in their community. Um, family resources facilitators receive a lot of training and ongoing mentoring, and they get certified through the state of Utah. They have to reach certain criteria in their practices. Um, they're the most well-trained position in the state of Utah, I believe. They have to go to bi-monthly trainings every other month for six hours. They get once a month on-site mentoring where we observe them and we report back. They have to get the practicum hours. Uh, we do something called high fidelity wraparound. So the, they're, even though they're peers, they are very well trained and they know how to speak with professionals. And they're, you can count on them to come in with a family and be professional and to um, help support that family in a very um, not professional but a professional way. And they come with their lived experience. So we find that it breaks down a lot of barriers. Family, or they're frustrated and they're angry. Um, they don't understand the language. They don't understand how to fill out an SSI application so they get accepted when they really need it. So FRS have been there and done that. And we can connect with parents on another level.
results and it helps parents to be able to trust somebody and then we can act as a bridge to help them communicate with the school or communicate with their mental health provider or communicate with the you know, SSI people. We can really help with that because of the lived experience. And it builds um, pretty much instant trust with a lot of parents who are what are called resistant. And you know, if they're not engaging, then the only resource is still here. So it's a good, it's a good um, ally for those families to help them engage the process of how do we help, how does your, what does your family need, how, what kind of help do you need, and how can we help you. Um, and then once the families identify what their needs are, we can explore options with the family, and we let them choose. But we help walk them through everything. So it's a very empowering process. Um, we don't, we're not case managers. We don't just have a family come sit in front of us and tell us what's wrong and we give them a bunch of resources and say, we see us. We, we are peers with them. So we work with them as peers. We do link them to resources. We link them to the local support groups and classes. We help them advocate for their child with agencies. And the other thing that we do is we try to use the wraparound approach. And I bet you everybody in here has a different definition of wraparound. But um, our definition, high fidelity wraparound, is an evidence-based practice model. And there are certain measures that we measure it to make sure it's fidelity. And really, the cornerstone of that is that they stay engaged the whole process. Without engagement, nothing happens. Engagement means they get to always have a voice. They're driving the process. It's youth-guided, family-driven. Um, we build natural support. Um, lots of research shows that people who don't have a lot of natural supports in their lives and don't know how to tap into their natural support network are going to struggle more than people who automatically. Some of us just naturally build our support network. We didn't even know we built it, but we built it, we utilized it, we know when to call for help, who to ask for help, and we do that naturally. A lot of the families are struggling. They don't have that natural support network, so we help them develop a natural support network. Um, and then we integrate the help that they need for their family. We, so we can help act as a communicator and help them learn how to organize that help that they need to hopefully their lives will function better when all the help is integrated. Um, and then we, doing this process, we do it with them and we don't keep it a secret. We tell them, we're doing wraparound. It's a planning process. This is how we do it. We help them build the skills, the confidence, and the ability to learn how to do this process. We work with the family for a year or two doing this wraparound process, and by the time we are you know, leaving their lives, they will be able to do this themselves. So it's really it's not just a case manager fix this, come in, give them a resource, although sometimes we will do that. If the family's got natural support and they just need help with one thing, we can come in and help them with one or two resources and get out of their lives immediately. But families have a lot of complex ongoing needs. We really end up working with them for a while and helping them get things organized um, and develop these natural supports, um, integrate their health, and build the skills and confidence that they can manage their lives on their own. So that's what family resource facilitators do. Do you have any questions at this point before I talk about how you can connect with one? So, how do I Oh yeah, that's going to be next. I'll talk about oh, how to who and how to link. Um, so you said like many mental. What if there are uh, environmental issues and things they need to get for their environment and medical situation? Can you get in and help find resources for that way? So we help families who have children and youth with complex needs kind of broadly define that. So if, um, and if the family would like the assistance of a peer support person to come in and work with them and see how what they could tap into in the community and what, what they can, you know, they would like that kind of help and assistance, then we are happy to work with them. The one thing that happens a lot is people find out about what we do, the FRS, and they, providers start sending tons of referrals to us and then right. we go and try to hunt them down. And <laughs> they don't want us to. Right. Yeah. They don't. They don't. Re so we're, we really like it. If you have a family that you think could benefit from some of the services that FRS provide, um, 
we ask that you talk to the family, and you can make copies of these. I can email you another way of brochures, too, that you could give to a family. Um, and you can talk to them and say, these are what family resource facilitators do, and I thought about you, and do you think this is something? They're just family members. They're not professionals. They're not coming in. They don't have mandates. We don't mandate. It's all voluntary. You can work with them. If you like it, great. If you don't, you can fire them. We work for the family, and we're no charge. So if a family says, yeah, I think I'd like that kind of support, have them call. And, and down here at the bottom, in Salt Lake County, Mary Gooley is a Division of Youth Services. And she will talk with the family and find out what's going on in general, um, and what their needs are, where they live. And then she will um, hook them up to a FRS that is. Like we've got, we've got a couple of FRS who really have personal lived experience in institute. And so all of our FRS have different types of lived experience. And she will kind of hook them up with the best fit. Because she really, we really want to try to match that lived experience to the, um, to the family. We have FRS who have children who have had autism, um, schizophrenia. Uh, we've had, you know, just the whole mix. So she knows where each FRS lived experience is, and she tries to match the family to the best FRS. We have two Spanish-speaking FRS, so obviously if the parents don't speak English, we match them with one of those FRS. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you'd call Mary Gooley. He has 10 FRS in Salt Lake County. The parent can tell them a little bit about how old my child is, where I'm having struggles, what I'm struggling with, um, what I want help with, and where I live. Because then we kind of try to figure this out and match up to the right FRS. So if we were to see, like, say their primary diagnosis is that as more people out there, but now we see, like, there's a person from the state or the top line complexity. Right. Would this be uh, somebody that we could, if they were wanting to receive these services, every person? So it probably couldn't be just medical. But like okay. you said, if they're struggling with a lot of behavioral stuff, and it could be because of the medical, I mean, it's all a mix, right? Right, it is. <laughs> and we're just out in the home. Yeah, and, and if you, yeah if you have a, um, a, a diagnosis of a medical condition, oftentimes, if not all the time, it's going to cause some mental health right. issues, some depression, anxiety, frustration, especially kids in school, um, it's going to cause some behavioral health issues. So yeah, but make sure the families don't just call and say, my child has a medical condition. I guess. They have to say they have a medical condition, but it's, it's um, causing a lot of behavioral okay. stuff. And I need help with problem solving around a school issue or the home you know, behavioral issues at home, or whatever it is. Okay. So it has to be part of that. Well, yeah. So in Davis County, I think we have four or five. Um, so if you want to, um, outside of Salt Lake County, if you have a family, you can either have them call me, and my number's on here, um, and I can hook them up with a FRS outside of Salt Lake County. Um, the other thing you can do is you can go to the NAMI Utah website, or you can go to allieswithfamilies.org. Allieswithfamilies.org website keeps the, the um, FRF contact list updated um, more regularly than the NAMI one does. So it'll tell you all the FRFs in that area, and then you can call them directly or help the family. They are, but they are not. Right. So the state contract, contracts through Davis Behavioral Health to have family resource facilitators. So they're they're not um, they're they're actually paid by a grant through the state for family advocacy, even though they're housed at Davis Behavioral Health. And Davis Behavioral Health has a, one at court and one at a couple of schools. So they're housed through Davis Behavioral Health, but they don't work for Davis. I think family, like a family support and that they were fighting for, we were fighting for the um, what they and they would not talk to the FRF because they thought it was someone who was trying to coax them in. 
I am not in my own. Yes, I understand that, and that does happen sometimes. Families don't have the trust because it's a government, you know, or it's a, um, you know, it's, there's, I'm going to the office at DCFS. I don't trust this person. So, you know, and that, I see that does happen. Family resource facilitators are really supposed to um, not be, like, trying to get the family to cooperate with services. They're trying to help the family explore other options, help bridge the gap between the treatment that they need and what they want, and have that help facilitate the communication between the treatment provider and the family, and help you know the family to get their needs met. Um, if there's treatment recommendations, maybe they can talk with the family about why the recommendations are there, make sure they really understand them, but so we honor the family's final voice and choice. So. I don't know if that family ever decided to talk with the FRF or if they ever did. I hopefully they would experience that the FRF really is an advocate. And I know that's confusing and we like to, um, we always think that the family advocates should be employed and housed through our family organizations. Um, and in some parts of the state they are now because that happens. Because, if we, you know, we're like, yeah, come to Davis Behavioral Health and, health and see me and I don't work for them, but I'm here. And I see them every day, and I work with them. There's still that trust issue. So some parts of the state, um, the FRS are hired through NAMI, or not, well, not through NAMI, through Allies or New Frontiers, and they are housed there. But they, but they're, they say, I don't work for them. My paycheck is from this family advocacy organization. I'm just here because I see a lot of their clients, and then that kind of. Um, it's three years at a time, so we have two more years right now. And what we started, and um, when I first started my job in um, October of 2007, it was it's only one year. So I'm like, okay, I'll just do it. And then it was like, it's only one more year, and I'll just keep doing it. Now it's three years, three years, three years. Um, grant. You all know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, we do. Our, our um, Spanish-speaking FRS know all the resources. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's several in Utah County. And the other thing that we do too is we can, if a family calls us, we can come to them and meet them. They don't have to come to Data Behavioral Health. At least that's how it should be. So we can come out to their home. We can meet them at McDonald's. We can meet them at the park. We give them voice and choice right from day one. Where would you like to meet? Where are you comfortable? Yes, we have family <coughs> facilitators statewide, um, and the only place that we don't have one is up in Brigham City. We have one in Bear River, but Bear River Mental Health serves over in um, <coughs> Brigham City, and if we have families who live there. They have to travel. They can't. They won't have the funding to let their FRF travel all the way over. That's like the only one spot that we have a little bit of a TikTok podcast. But otherwise, they're statewide and FRS travel. Our FRS in, in landing travel three hours to meet with family. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I am so excited about it. <laughs> um, so just to make sure you know who the majority of this is and what they do. Um, so not, not everyone, but a lot of folks in this room provide a very similar kind of service in a, a medical practice, a pediatric practice. I was excited to hear that, like coordinators with pediatric right, facility right, yeah. and um, hospitals. Yeah. And so they're already working with complex kids and, um, and, and trying to do a lot of things and then the behavioral health issues that come along with that just add another yeah. many layers. And as you heard, that's really what we talk about when we talk about um, cases and right. concerns. That's always really what it comes to. So I know they're all very excited. But in order to help that communication still be flowing within the, the primary care practice and with the care coordinator, would that be something that if the family in question said, I'm comfortable with my care coordinator talking with my FRS, um, that, that that communication could happen? Yes. When a family resource facilitator starts working with a family, um, one of the things they do is they find out what the professionals are involved, and they, they ask permission to talk with the professionals. Because sometimes what we hear from the family is absolutely 
valid and it's their perspective and their frustration. Um, but it's always helpful for an FRS to also get to talk to the professionals involved so that if, if there's a miscommunication or the family is not understanding something, we can come in and help bridge that gap um, versus coming in and saying, you're not listening to this family without the answer yet. So we always do that anyway. We will call and we'll get their permission first. We'll, we'll engage with them first and talk with them first. But then we'll, we'll tell them, you know, it would be helpful for me to help you and advocate for you if I can go talk to the school or go talk to your care coordinator or go talk to your therapist. Is that something that the family would be willing to do? And most families say yes, because they want to make things work. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, again, if you guys have, you guys probably see families who the, parents are already coordinating and following through and doing everything. Um, and then you have families who just get stuck. So those would be the families that maybe need that peer support. And how long is your typical situation? So you mean how long is an FRM involved with the family? Yeah. So if a family comes in and they're pretty on the ball but they have like one big issue, say their child's in court and they're just struggling with this court piece. They don't understand the whole process of the language, which is very confusing. Or say they just have one thing, a school issue, or they just earn a temporary financial bind and they need We could come in and work with them for a week or two and be gone. If they've got a lot of stuff going on, we start using the wraparound approach. And we start we start with their strengths. That's the first thing we do. We say, we do a strength assessment. Let's find out what your family's strengths are. We want to know everyone lives in the home. What are their strengths? What are their interests? What are goals, or their dreams, what do you want your life to look like, what's missing, what do you need. We really do this thorough strength assessment, very holistic. Who are the people involved in your life? Who cares about you? What professionals are involved? And then we say, okay, here's all your strengths. Here's what you guys say you need help with. Here's all the people involved. Let's do this planning process, organize, come up with a creative, creative solutions that fit who you are. That's what wraparound is. So we do that whole process. And we can do that around as many needs as they have. If they have two or three needs, we might be done in six months. They have 10, might be two years. Okay. All right. I think we might want a copy of your needs assessment here. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds oh, really good. Good. And I'm happy to come back and talk more about some of the pieces of your several or wrap around with one other. Right. Okay. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Wendy. You're welcome. Um, and we'll make sure that the, the website so that you can see the FRS, you know, the Alex family, we'll make sure all of that goes in the notes. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so um, Susan, great, wonderful. And Susan, do you have anything that you'd like me to put on the screen or? Lots of things. Lots of things, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Susan, uh, Susan? Yeah. with uh, Valley Behavioral. Okay. And we're really pleased that you're here today. Thank you. You're going to do all this. Okay. Um, my first 15 years with Valley was uh, running a day treatment program. It was 
called CBT, Children's Behavior Therapy Unit, out on the west side. It was in a school. So that's where um, my passion really grew, was working with really high acuity families with very low resources, and how can you um, bring some stability and some services and resources to families that really don't have a lot of services. Um, part of what I'm going to talk about, so you've gotten several different handouts. One is a school-based brochure um, that shows where we are in schools right now, and I'll talk about that. And I guess I'll talk about that now, because that's when I'm talking about my experience in school. One is a school-based brochure. One is a IRAC, which is an intensive in-home program that we provide, and our FRF, Mandy, um, as we work with these services, and Wendy and Mary Gooley at these services, Mandy is attached to our IRAC team as well, as part of those people that can be um, the first out in the community. And there's also a, the blue brochure is for children's services, and we are, that one is under construction, so that will be a, a different look to it. And then the green sheet is, I think, a nice kind of cheat sheet. It gives um, an array of continuum of services that you can access with children. And finally, if, after all this is said and done, if you have any questions, just email me, and that's really the easiest way, and I'll get back to you. Um, so let me start with, I just want to say, so historically Valley was the Medicaid provider for the county for those of you that have been around for a while. Um, we lost that contract, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, and it was really, there was a lot of chaos that went with that. You know, we had about $55 million that we could allocate services for Medicaid clients, and we then shrunk from $55 million to about $24 million. And so based upon that, we had to cut a lot of programs. Um, we lost a lot of our really good friends in the process, people that, that left Valley. It was a really, really tough time. Um, but from that disparity, we did, we did require us to diversify and change how we deliver services. So what happened at that point is clinicians then became paneled with private insurance. Um, they still could see Medicaid clients. So that gave us a little bit more diversity about clients that we could see. So that's the current landscape of where we are right now. Um, jumping around, as I said, I was a clinician in school about 15 years. Um, my good friend Karen retired from children's outpatient and I inherited her program. And what was nice about that is that it really helped to flow school programs into our outpatient clinics. So there weren't divides about how do you access med management, you know, who do you have to talk to to gain access to services and other um, pieces of the children's continuum. So I oversee our, our school-based program. Um, I oversee our children's outpatient program. Um, I oversee our IRAP intensive animal programs, and we also have two school-based programs called CBT, the Children's Behavior Therapy Unit. One's in the Salt Lake District, and one is in Granite District. Um, with the school-based program, I'll start with that. Um, six years ago, we were in seven schools in Salt Lake County. We were in Murray, uh, Canyons, Granite, and Salt Lake City School District. Um, oftentimes, people will ask, why aren't you in Jordan? We are not yet in Jordan. We would like to be in Jordan. Um, each school district does things a little bit differently, and right now they're addressing mental health um, within their internal structure. Uh, so six years ago, we were in about seven schools, and this fall we're in 42 schools. Um, it's been a significant, um, exhausting, but incredibly exciting growth. Um, when we first did this, I didn't have a desire to create this school empire and, and, and go into more schools. Um, well, what happens is if you have a school that calls you, so for example, this summer I got a call from the assistant principal of West High, and she said, we'd like services. And for you know everybody that's been in the Valley, why would I not put services in West High? It just really makes sense. And especially if you look on the back side of the brochure that shows the schools where we are, that we provide services in the elementary schools, and then we grow into the middle schools. And so there's a continuum of services, and we engage families. Um, so why would I not go to West High? I have to go to West High. Um, you know, what we know is that there's a high incidence of suicide and self-injury with 10th graders. Um, this past year, um, we added seven high schools, which was really bizarre because when we first started this model, we were just focusing on elementary early intervention and prevention. And I think, like for me at least, 10 years ago, we were talking about how do we help the little ones and that the older kids in high school were kind of like, ah, oh, you know, they don't really care. There's been a real shift I see in the educational community where the conversation is how do we help keep these high school kids on track for graduation attached to their communities, attached to schools, attached to adults and peers that care about them. So this past summer, for example, we added Ranger High, we added Hillcrest High, we added Diamond Ridge, um, Horizonte, we have a full time at East, full time at West. And I'm 
really excited that we're now starting to have a conversation at Brighton. And so for everyone that knows the community, there were a lot of tragedies at Brighton. Um, you know, I was in, Lee and I were both in Park City um, this past week, um, working with the local community there. And um, we, went, I went, we went to the school and did some work with the kids. And then, um, we, and it was really interesting, because what I heard the kids say a lot of is we knew they were suicidal, but we didn't want to get them in trouble. And so that's a, that's a big burden for, for little 13-year-olds, little 12-year-olds to carry. And so it is opening up this conversation in the schools. And then I was at a forum, community forum in Park City, I think it was Monday, thank you. <laughs> Monday night, and there were a lot of parents that really had a lot of questions. And our city, we do have school-based services there. Um, it's a lot smaller than Salt Lake County, but that really does seem to be the, the, the focus about how do we insert services in our community. We know school-based services is phenomenal because you don't have transportation barriers, you don't have scheduling barriers. Kids don't leave for appointments and never come back. Um, we want to engage the families in therapy at the schools, but realistically, we know that many of our families um, are working several jobs, they have transportation um, concerns, and we're not going to be able to get them to school. So we do make phone outreaches to try to get them engaged in working with their child. So that's what we've been doing with school days. I mean, I still get requests to add more therapists. Um, it's, it's a little bit more than the supply and demand is a little bit of a so I think we're kind of stable where we are right now with the exception of Brighton. We'd like to have that conversation with Brighton. Um, any questions on school-based services? Do have therapists actually at the school? We do. We do. So I have about 42 therapists that do school-based mental health. Um, and they're all independent contractors. And they're all these amazing people that you know, folks that have practiced at um, neurology, learning behavior a uni, primary children's Odyssey house. Um, there are people that have been, I have several that are maybe moms that you know don't want to work the 60 hours a week or they want more flexibility in scheduling. Um, so there is an on They are Is your credit? Are you just okay? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs>
um, if she has a kid, she could email me, and then we could connect them because we're all looking about how to do this integrated care. Uh, does that help? Yeah. yeah. So they don't have to go through Indicate at Valley first. Good question. They do, but Indicate can happen at the school. It is just like going to a clinic. Um, but you do your intake actually on site. So all the contractors have their own office space at Valley or at the school. Um, they all have secure um, internet access so they can actually log into their Valley website at the school. They have an office. They work with the school team. Um, they would. So what would happen is the process works. The school identifies a kid or you guys identify a kid and they say, like, we think that this kid would really benefit from services. They call the parent. Hey, we've got this great service conveniently located at our school. We think it would really benefit your child. Would you be interested? Yes. They give that referral sheet to our therapist. She does her funding things, which I can go back to. She calls the family, sets up an intake. The parent has to come to intake to consent to treatment. They do sign a release of information because our mission of being at school is not creating outpatient clinics. It's about how do I help this child succeed at school. And so there's Probably have a rough day today. There was some domestic violence that occurred at the home this past week, and so he's really going to struggle. You know, they're going to be very, they're going to be um, adhered to HIPAA, and they're going to be discreet about what they do and don't divulge. So the question is, how do I help this kid be successful at school? And as the kid's meeting with me as a clinician, he may talk about trauma, he may talk about abuse, and I'm going to address that. Yet I'm also going to work collaboratively with the school team about coping strategies and problem solving strategies to help him stay in the class. Does that answer that? Yeah. I think you Hi, Dr. Allen. How are you? Hi. <laughs> what about uh, something novel like a two way communication between the therapist and the team at school and the primary care system? Uh, and in some cases, uh, are there some models where there is this collaborative arrangement where physicians or health providers might be involved in meditation, <laughs> maybe even with some, some consultation support from psychiatry uh, under Valley, and then be able to, to do, a, uh, do that together with the, with the yeah, and, you, and, and get back and forth. Yes, and you created a model when I was at CBT. You know, you used to come out there and collaborate with us. You're the only physician that would ever come, or doctor that would ever come out and see us. So I remember that. Um, great question. And so part of what I talked about that continuum and that flow is that um, in children and patients, so one of the things that we all know is it's hard to ask time or nurse practitioner time. So that was a really big push for us was to increase our um, medical support at Valley within the children's team. So about six months ago, we had one nurse practitioner and a part-time child psychiatrist, and, and appointments got really far out. So I'm very excited. We have two full-time nurse practitioners. We have another part-time nurse practitioner that um, she interned with us past her board. She's going to be joining us in another month. So that gets us two and a half nurse practitioners and Dr. Baez, who's board certified and bilingual. He's with us three Fridays. Um, a month, and he's also the director at, at Davis. And so that's really um, shifted our access to psychiatric services, because that's a big piece of it. Like Leah and I were just looking at a referral this morning of a kid in a school that's super high acuity. We can get that kid out within a couple of days to med services if it's a very high acuity kid. I mean, that to me, because I think me being in the schools all that year, being so frustrated about you had to know the secret handshake, and you had to beg and tell your parent, you know, Oh, you're on this wait list, or you have to go and walk in, and it's terrible. So there really has been a huge shift. So if you have a kid and they they can't just go to med services, they have to first be established as a client. But we can we had a kid walk in yesterday to our clinic, a 17 year old kid. Um, he was had voices in his head. He said demons were telling him to kill him. And he he came into the clinic. We called MCOT. Mom was Spanish speaking. MCOT worked with him, and he has um, an in-home appointment with our IRAP team today, and he has an appointment. They took him to the hospital because he was under the influence of the to stabilize, but he has an appointment with um, our in-home team today, and he has a med appointment that they followed. I mean, that's, that's cool I stuff to me. I like being able to do that. Definitely. I mean, you know, being in 56 schools now, you know, years ago. I think the other point, though, too, is, 
have a great knowledge <coughs> of, of these children who are seen in school. And I think they lament, you know, they lament that they don't have a, a part in that treatment. Um, and of course, I know there's, there's insurance issues, and, and most of the kids I've been talking about are, are, are they Medicaid? Yeah, I'll jump into that. And, I, and again, we do give releases information for those, those people that are central to that child's life. And so we do always ask as part of our intake, you know, the primary care physician. Sometimes parents want to share, sometimes they don't. And I'll be honest, you know, when I was practicing, it was, you know, it's hard to reach a doctor. They're really busy and they don't always call you back. So I think we could probably do a better job um, trying to emphasize reaching out on that end. Let me talk to you about the funding pieces. Um, but first I'll jump to you. So children's outpatient, that's also clinics or some of our places where people want to be seen. So we've got schools, we've got clinics. We have our clinic, which is right across the street from St. Mark's, the East Side Clinic. We've got our other clinic, which is on Bangor and 62. That's our West Side Clinic. Between the two clinics, we've got about 25 clinicians, um, specialty practices. Uh, we have no just certified. We have therapists that specialize in autism. Um, EMDR, DDT, um, trauma focus, um, what else am I forgetting? <laughs> okay, it's kind of a gamut. So, so there's a, you know, you can have a kid in the school and maybe they have some profound trauma and want to do some family work at the clinic. They can be seen at both places because it's not duplicative if we're doing different emphases. But back to the funding, it's a great question. That's changed um, dramatically, and I do appreciate Salt Lake County as being part of that. About seven years ago, um, we were awarded the RFP for the Early Intervention Building Blocks Grant, which is throughout the state of Utah. But for Salt Lake County Valley, was um, we've been given the privilege of being able to access that grant. So the Early Intervention Building Blocks Grant in the schools allows us to see kids that are unfunded. Um, the question before, when do kids that are, that are not documented we can see? kids that shift coverage, those are all covered automatically under the grant. So they can automatically access services. Again, we talked about Medicaid. If you're a private insurance um, client, you can be seen through private insurance. We're basic, we're paneled with most private insurances, including Select Health, which opted to panel with us about a, a little over a year ago. That really opened up a lot of doors for us, which was exciting. I think Aetna's about one of the only ones I can think of we're not paneled with. Um, the one category I didn't talk about are those that are underfunded. So, for example, if you carry Blue Cross Blue Shield, you can't afford your copay, you can't afford your deductible. The parent works with the school counselor. They write up a little story basically saying, this is why I need services. This is my monthly income. These are my monthly expenses. I send that to my counterpart at the county. Um, he reviews those and approves those. So, it's really, uh, this past quarter we served about 850 139 were on the grant. So those are kids that otherwise I would not have been able to access services the same way. Um, I think there's probably been about two kids over the past year we have not been able to get approved to serve in the school. Um, so for me, being able to say yes is really exciting and serve everybody we get. In our outpatient clinic, we also have a, a the resource and resiliency uh, clinic grant, which allows us to be unfunded clinic. So just your number of kids you've seen through those clinics, just over in a year period, about how many? I would say, I was thinking about this the other day, I think between my eight and the last, I've got about um, 3,000 kids in those two clinics. Um, in school base, we talked about 850, you can do the math, 850, and our IRAP in-home team, as of this morning, we have 101 clients open there. So. Right now, I'd say under our umbrella, we're like a little over 4,000, um, maybe 4,500 kids. Just in that, and then if you look at that green sheet that talks about continuum, we've also got our Artec day treatment program. Um, you've also got our kids ONA kind of program. You've got the ASAP um, youth drug and alcohol program, ACE is after school program. So those are those are just the ones that I oversee, and then there's the other pieces. But again, if you have questions on those other ones, we are and I can connect it off. <coughs> um, and then um, I want to share with Leah. And I think she is, uh, as our programs is grow, and she's um, yeah, doing a lot of outreach and um, team leads to these programs. But one of the areas I wanted to kind of the term of her talked a little bit about is she's been heading our Zero Suicide Academy um, for 
um, for Valley, and she and I are both going to the training. This is uh, for it's called SOS Signs of Suicide, and it's a, um, a state training, and so they invited us to go and become trainers. But Leah does a lot of suicide prevention, and we'll go to schools or groups or wherever um, she's asked to, to go. Kathy Davis, who's the state office of education, who does a lot of suicide prevention um, education, works closely with Leah, but I'll let her talk a little bit about that. Um, so I'm sure, sorry my voice is a little like speaking right now. Um, so I'm sure you've seen the news articles um, uh, this month, September, uh, Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Um, so you're cold. <laughs> um, so suicide, or September is our Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Utah, unfortunately, has, um, has found itself in a spot where youth suicide is the number one cause of death for kids 10 to 17 years old. Um, and those deaths are, are typically caused by firearms and or poisoning. The firearm death in Utah is the number one cause of death. Um, <laughs> um, um, so a couple things just to kind of be aware with your clients or people that you do see is um, uh, the state has released a really cool phone app. It's called Safe UT. Um, it's just any Play Store or um, the App Store has it, and it's again it's called Safe UT. Um, it's been introduced in most of the schools. It's slowly rolling out to all the school districts across the entire state. What's really cool about this app is that um, it's password protected. And you're thinking, why would an app be password protected? This is because this app not only is a direct call line to the crisis center, but you can also do text to the crisis center because we know kids like to text. Um, talking to a kid on the phone is, you know, hard to do at times. But they can text and have a text conversation with the crisis worker um, in real time. Um, additionally, they can go back to that text. So say their they're, they're feelings are kind of reduced. They're able to actually go back and know what that text conversation continues right where they left off. Um, additionally, there's a submit tip line on that that um, kids or adults can just text in, you know, I'm really worried about, you know, my friend, this is what they're saying. And from there, the crisis worker can um, <clears throat> talk with them and or send um, police um, to the home. So I think the Safe UT app is a really cool app. Um, I have all my clients actually download it on their phones as a resource um, and, and talk about that. Um, additionally, um, with suicide prevention, there's a big push um, from the Utah Suicide Prevention Coalition, from NAMI, um, to talk about name restrictions. Um, as, as, as research has shown, people who um, attempt suicide, they're attempting, 48% of them are attempting within 10 minutes of having a suicidal thought. 10 minutes. That's not a lot of time, and that really talks greatly about how impulsive that act is. So I'm talking with the families you work with about means restrictions, um, such as locking up medication. Um, you know, recently I was talking with a family who's, um, or, or a child who, you know, was having suicidal thoughts. She's like, I can just get my mom's cancer medication. It's in the cabinet. Mom doesn't have cancer anymore. Mom is in remission, but her cancer medication is still there. So again, talking with your families about getting rid of medications they don't need, means restrictions, lock it up. That also goes with checking to see if your families have guns in the home. Um, as we know, guns are, you know, the the main the main reason here in Utah for suicide deaths. Um, I think there was let's see, 1,399 uh, deaths by gun between uh, 2010 and 2014, and only about under 200 of those were by homicide or accidental, like accidental shooting. The rest were suicide. Um, so that's huge. Um, so talking about means restrictions, locking it up, having someone else store weapons, separating, you know, ammunition from, from guns. Um, so that's really the big push, um, you know, it's with suicide prevention um, and the fact that this month is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Just having that conversation with your, with your family and clients um, really goes far. And again, that Safety T app is a free app. It's a really cool app. Um, I suggest you all get it on your phone. Um, and you can show your clients. So. Your comments for how we can for you guys and the roles we can play. Yeah. So 
So um, I was I was a first year student, um, and we have a really great relationship with LA and the local And one of the things that I would say is as we try it. We like the idea of collaborative relationships, and we always encourage our patients to come in and see if the therapist is appropriate, because our physicians are managing medication, whether it's ADHD meds, whether it's their eyes, whether it's their um, It doesn't seem like a lot of the therapists, some of them are, but some of them are very reciprocal in that type of relationship. And I don't know if it's because they don't know what I mean, we talk to DB and she knows what we offer, and that there's a lot of practices, especially in pediatrics, who are looking for this type of relationship. And so if a therapist is aware that the medical office is looking for that type of relationship, and, and then a higher anxiety comes to life, you just maybe talk about changing medication, it would be nice if we could make those connections happen more often. Would you be, and I totally agree with you, um, would you be open to, you know, if I gave you my card and maybe we could meet with Jody or anybody you wanted to bring to the table um, and talk about that? Because I think just her having that awareness that that's what it's like when you're outside of Valley and being able to access and collaborate. Because again, for us, I try to be super open and transparent and bring in as many voices as I can to the table. I don't know if you think that would be helpful or... We, we've met, we've met, We've met with Jody several times, and she's aware, and I think she makes the therapist aware, but I think in the day-to-day, -day, that kind of gets lost a little bit, you know, because it's not an all-the-time thing. So I don't know how to help that happen as it needs to, um, with at least in the medicine for city, where right. everybody's on super high alert. Um, but just if, I don't know if there's culturally on both sides, mental health and the medical side, we need to collaborate with I, I agree with you. When I was at that forum, it was interesting on Tuesday night, and um, I don't know her last name, but Amanda, who does, she's great. And I saw her at the school, and she's sitting behind me. And it's really interesting because Dr. Thatcher from Valley was talking about, you know, somebody had asked a question, what do you do? If, you know, how do you, where do you go? And Amanda <laughs> kept saying behind me, you go talk to your primary care doctor. You talk to your primary care doctor. And she's like, should I say it? And I'm like, yeah, you should say it. And, and someone on the panel started talking about it and said it. So I agree with you. I think that um, that piece needs to be really critical piece. needs to be um, discussed more. I can, I'll chat with Dodie for sure. But I agree with you, and I appreciate you throwing it out there. But I thought it was pretty cute of Amanda because she's just screaming and saying, don't be saying this is the piece. And I think sometimes some different um, agents we have a different focus based upon maybe it's that I like to at least community isolated in the different resources. I and it was really, you know, it was really exceptional and it really brought a much different picture. Like it's either I'll mail okay. it to her, but no, I want you to do okay. that. I mean, it's, I want to be able to create that access. I want to be able to create partnerships. I mean, it makes sense. Like when I met with Tiffany from the asthma clinic, she said, I may not have anybody right now, and I only have 25 on my caseload. But the point is, of those 25, if there's some in there that are at Rose Park or at Glendale, and that would be an extra level of support. Right. That's great. So again, it's not about, it's about, Moving at your pace, resources we can bring to you or resources that you can bring to us. You know, we've met with Colin, we've met with Eric, we've met with Claudia, and again, in Maryland, and, and, and learning about resources you have. You know, we, we've shared one of our really, really challenging friends with Colin. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you just kind of are getting your head against the wall and don't know where to go. But. Wonderful. Yeah. Just for a point, you did mention 
identify a child requested a parent about the program, they agree, and then you raise the email or DM, and then um, anything happens at school. When it's a Spanish speaking family, how will that work? Great. And, and it can either be at school or the clinic, wherever it makes sense for the family to be seen. Um, we do um, use interpretive services. That's gone very smoothly. Um, I have about um, four bilingual clinicians that are in the schools. We do have two of our in-home, and Leah said I needed to talk a little bit more about IRAP, which is our intensive in-home program. You must have Medicaid or um, have an unfunded funding source to qualify for that, but you can have a therapist come into the home. If, there's, if they can't, it's for our highest security families. It's for families that really can't access the clinic. And it's really, how do I stabilize these families at home? So it could be a therapist that does parent-child engagement, a behaviorist that goes to the home and works on some behavioral strategies. It could be a case manager because they've lost their housing or they have bed bugs, or how do I apply for DSPB? Or if they don't have any funding source, that's when we rely on our very amazing FRL that can do really magic things and help families connect to resources that I have no idea how to do. Um, so that's um, that answer. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay if I send your emails in our summary emails? Yeah, that's okay. I'll give you one. So I'm happy to have that. I have you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, we, it's, it's been exciting because I like to talk about. There's been really big changes in the landscape. You know, I'm, I'm one of the older ones at Valley, and I've seen a lot of changes and. Um, for me, it's really my. I mean, for me, having access is really critical. Um, so, and trying to figure things out and kind of think outside the box and break rules occasionally and find out how we serve kids and, and families. So, oh, but I was saying we do have two bilingual um, in-home therapists as well, which has been incredible for us. Like yesterday, when that kid was in the clinic, one of our bilingual therapists was able to meet with mom, and it was it's huge. So after we.
And then um, our next meeting is October 19th, um, uh, next regular meeting, and it will be on asthma. So we've got three great speakers to talk about you know, some of the asthma programs and things, initiatives that are going on um, around that. So my battery is running very low, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut down and say thank you and have enough to take a donut, take a, take a cake, uh, eat, eat. Thanks, you guys.